Hello and welcome to this History of Bridport presentation brought to you by the Dorset Tasmania History Society. My name is Nigel Mercer and the main presenter will be Jeff Jennings. We currently have over 50 financial members. We run an active Facebook page called the Dorset Tasmania History Society where we have over 3,200 people who follow our Facebook page. We have an archive of over 16,300 catalogued images. And by catalogued, I mean that for every image that we store, we try and identify any person who's in the image by name and any building or landmark or other artifact that's in that photo is so that as a history society, we can answer questions like, do you have any photographs of my grandfather, John Smith? The society holds monthly meetings. We meet on the first Thursday of every month of the year, except January. We hold our meetings in the Scottsdale Mechanics Hall at 6 p.m. in the evenings, and everyone is welcome to attend our monthly meetings. Now, talking about the history of Bridport, there is a published book called The History of Bridport. It was published in 1983, so amazingly 40 years ago. And the author of that History of Bridport is Jeff Jennings. And so 40 years later, we're still very happy to have Jeff here presenting the History of Bridport in images and videos. Again, just briefly about what our society tries to do. We were formed to research, record, and disseminate historical information from the Dorset region, which is the whole of the Dorset region. There's about 47 distinct localities in the Dorset region. We try to provide a safe and trusted repository for historic, historical information and artifacts. Now that's a fairly new thing we're getting into. But rather than things ending up at the tip, the History Society wants to be a place where people have got things that they don't want to hold on to anymore. Maybe the family is not interested. We want to provide a museum standard repository for those items to be stored and preserved. We like to share information and work with others to record and preserve history. Importantly for us, we aim to be a well-run trusted and professional history group. We realise that history is mostly about the history of people and in telling those histories and recording those histories we work very hard to respect the privacy of those people but at the same time we want to try and record just what their lives are like. It's a very important thing to do. So without further ado I'll hand over to Jeff for a history of Bridport. In talking about the history of Bridport, it must be recognised that Australia was not terra nullius and had been occupied for 30 to 40,000 years prior to European arrivals. I leave the story of the Aborigines in Tasmania to experts. The pre-European history of Waterhouse area with interviews with Patsy Cameron can be found on the Society's Facebook site and you should read Patsy's book, Greece and Ochre. The first Europeans to visit the Bridport area came by ship. Matthew Flinders and George Bass sailed along the northeast coast of Tasmania in 1798, exploring and surveying the coast and eventually circumnavigating Van Diemen's Land. They named some of the geographically significant places in the northeast, like Cape Portland, Waterhouse Island, Double Sandy Point, Ninth and Tenth Islands some of them just a simple list of the islands visited. You can understand why they named this double sandy point, but they would have to choose a different name today. The dunes have been vegetated as part of the coastal dune stabilisation carried out by the Lands Department in the 1980s. Some say this has resulted in a reduction of sand on Bridport's beaches, exposing rocks. The other issue is that Aboriginal middens and geologically interesting structures have been destroyed. Not to mention 
the dunes were a popular destination for outdoor fun. In 1998, Master Mariner Bernie Cuthbertson re-enacted the circumnavigation of Tasmania in a replica of the 33-foot Norfolk. This vessel can be viewed in the Georgetown Maritime Museum. The next European visitor to the district was Nicholas Baudin, who sights Waterhouse Island while waiting to rendezvous with his second ship, the Naturalist, but he fails to meet them. He was searching for the lost French La Perouse expedition. In 1816, Captain James Kelly in the whaleboat Elizabeth landed on Waterhouse Island and Ringrimmer Point, probably Cape Portland. He was circumnavigating Van Diemen's Land. He reported seeing many smokes along this coast and met up with Tasmanian Aborigines when at Cape Portland. His journey was re-enacted by Byrne Cuthbertson in 1986. Later, in 1824, Lieutenant Hobbs travelled along the coast from Georgetown and walked in the Waterhouse area, describing numerous marshes teeming with ducks. He reported the land in between marshes, nothing but pebbles and sand. The first land-based survey of the Britport area was by Thomas Lewis, who in 1829 mapped many of the significant geographical features in northeast Tasmania, including naming the rivers along the coast, like the Charwell, Trent, Duck and Serpentine. None of these names were accepted due to a disagreement with a Surveyor-General. It was rumoured Lewis had had an affair with a Surveyor-General's wife. He saw and heard signs of Aborigines in the Bridport area, footprints in the sand and the barking of dogs. He saw no white people. Lewis mentions meeting sealers, Tasmanian Aboriginals, on his travels. The names Trentwater and Micah Creek have been retained from this survey. Between 1830 and 1831, George Augustus Robertson travelled through the area near Bridport, discovering many signs of native encampments. He was accompanied by a number of Tasmanian Aborigines, including Chief Manalagena. He did see Europeans who were on an illegal hunting party looking for Aborigines. At that time, the area abounded with wildlife, including forester kangaroo and emus. Government surveyors visited the Bridport area between 1836 and 1861. The purpose was to officially survey land that had been allocated in the early 1830s to people such as Captain Charles Brown Hardwick, Thomas Williams and Janet and Andrew Anderson. These maps show the properties in the Waterhouse area. Thomas Williams and Charles Hardwick certainly lived on their properties as James Scott's diary records meeting them and even drinking a glass of wine and watching them herding sheep across the Great Forester River at what later became Bridport. The road to Cape Portland is marked by a red line on the right-hand side map. Hardwick's property was later managed by Charles Hedlam in 1848 and later by Thomas Hardman. This is known as the Waterhouse Estate. They were mainly sheep grazing properties. James Scott's notebooks confirm that by 1836 there were permanent residents in this area. There were also numerous servants, mostly ticket of leave men, who travelled regularly between Georgetown and this area to cart goods and report to the police with their tickets of leave. Scott also reports seeing wild dogs, possibly Tasmanian tigers, and meeting Dawson, another surveyor, who reported seeing sealers and two Aborigines, one of them Old Munro from Preservation Island. This is James Scott's map of land granted to Mrs Janet Anderson and Andrew Anderson in 1833. According to Scott, they had been in the district even before 1832. The survey was done sometime later in 1845. The Anderson stay was short-lived, but they are remembered in the naming of Anderson's Bay. This Google Earth photo shows where the homestead was located, near the present Barnboogle Dunes clubhouse. 
the course of the lower Great Forest River is largely unchanged. A close-up of the map shows stockyards and a bridge across the Great Forest River. James Anderson asked to relocate their location as it was often underwater. He had to employ sealers living on the coast at a considerable cost, row around his property to locate his boundaries. Martin Mowbray Stevenson purchased the Anderson land in 1845, which they named Barn Bugle, after the family ancestor's Scottish castle. Martin married Eleanor Ann Brewer of Bowood. The Stevens were a prominent family in Launceston, and they lived on the property for over 40 years. This is the Barn Bugle homestead showing the Stevenson family. Martin is probably the person on the far right. It also shows some of the equipment needed to farm in the 1880s. The high-pitched shingle roof typical of the era. The house appears to be built on a sand dune. Martin Stevenson also had problems with his property, the Great Forester River frequently flooding the land. He asked James Scott to resurvey his land, but Scott replied it was impossible, it was underwater. Only after the cut was constructed in 1923 was flooding reduced, but not eliminated. The brewers of Bowood played a significant role in the development of Bridport, Scotch New Country and Dorset. Peter married Elizabeth Harrington Jones of Piper's River and established the Bowood property from 1835. The family owned and leased much of the land to the west of the Brid River. He died in 1851 and his widow Elizabeth Harrington Brewer ran the property until 1871 After Peter's death, his eldest son Alfred assumed much of the responsibilities of management. An extract from Alfred William Brewer's diary, May 1862, 19th of June. 336 cases of fruit shipped in the Waterwich. Thomas Cox here all night towards town. Tingley killed his pig. I started to walk to town and went to Chester's. Reached town on Wednesday the 28th. Got home again on Sunday. Walked the whole distance in the day. The road men here. This would have been the Campbells who were building the Bridport to Scotch New Country Road. Bowood is the oldest surviving building in the Dorset municipality. It was completed in 1844. Named after an ancient hunting forest in England, the house faces south and is built of pit sawn timber handmade bricks and local stone by carpenter James Edwards and stonemason Robert Rhodes. Rhodes was a sealer who Peter Brewer found living in an old native encampment near Bowood. He was born in Philadelphia. Many ticket of leave men worked at Bowood, including the one-armed Booth. Alfred Brewer describes how he had to pare the calluses off Booth's back with a knife on account of the many lashes he had received. This map shows the new road to Bridport from Launceston, surveyed by Richard Hall, and the extent of some of the early land grants and their satellite properties at Fernie Hill. Later, the Brewers leased most of the land between the Forester rivers. An early oil painting showing wagons carting wool bales to be shipped from the Brid River jetty to Launceston. In the background, you can just see Brimelaw House, built by James Campbell. The wool probably came from Bowood. Investigating the naming of places in the area shows that many place names allocated along the coast have associations with places along the coast of Dorset in southern England. Possibly named by a land-based cartographer after naval survey by Captain John Lord Stokes in Amos Spiegel in 1843. The names might have been assigned by a cartographer office-based as some of the locations have no real geographical basis, i.e. Swanage, which is just a sandy beach. These maps of 1859 and 1860 show the first land sold in Bridport. 
These properties became the core of the town for many years. It was here that the first houses were built. Elizabeth Harrington Brewer was an astute business person, purchasing many of the first blocks in the township of Bridport. Other purchases included William Pitt, William Henry Jones, Joseph Hazelwood, James Campbell, James Crabtree and Thomas Diprose. It also shows the river crossing on the road to Cape Portland and Waterhouse and the best site for shipping produce from the new country. This map combines the earlier ones and shows the location of the Dorset Steam Navigation Jetty, the Police Station Reserve and additional blocks of land sold to William Henry Jones, Samuel Hawkes and Richard Hall. It also shows the Cemetery Reserve. This is Bridport in 1949, showing how Bridport had expanded much further to the north. If we superimpose the old 1860 map, we can see how much the river mouth and channel have altered, but it is still shallow and sandy. The spit is much shorter than today. Now we superimpose the 2002 era view of Bridport to see many significant changes, increased settlement, and the river channel has been extended and straightened. Possibly one of the oldest photographs taken in Bridport. This is taken on the Brid River, just behind the present day Torrington House. Roger McLennan and I did some research and eventually found the exact spot where the 1890 stereoscopic photograph had been taken. Although the previous maps and aerial photographs show how much has changed since the 1800s, the Brid River here looks much the same. The year 1858 is the year when European settlers first came to the area that was called Scott's New Country, named after this man, James Scott. So he had done some surveys in the 1850s and identified the potential of all this land in the area that we now know as Jetsonville and Scottsdale. And the first thing that the new settlers really needed was roads. So the only way in was via the north. The settlers came from Launceston up north to Mount Direction across to Bowood where they would buy some supplies and then down the road that we now call the Bridport Road in order to settle on their land in Jetsonville and Scottsdale. In 1860, there was a government report that said the expense of 16 miles of road from Scots country to Bridport is estimated at 300 pounds. And by spending that sum, it would open up 15,000 acres of magnificent land, which if sold would yield a sum of 18,000 pounds. But that never happened, and roads became a contentious issue for many, many years. However, in 1860, there were some land sales in Bridport, and some of the names we would recognise today, so Brewers, Diproses, Campbells and Headlams. In 1863, gold was allegedly discovered at Piper's River, and in 1864, there was an amount of £11,000 allocated for a road of 40 miles distance from Launceston to the Ringaruma country and £3,360 for 14 miles of road to connect Bridport with the Scots New Country and Ringaruma areas. But these are the arguments that went to the Parliament not everyone was convinced. One of the naysayers pointed out that at the time there were probably only 30 or 40 settlers at Scott's New Country and said if you spent that amount of money it would be merely tinsel, showy and superfluous ornament without any substantial utility. And the reality was those roads never got built. Gold was discovered in 1869 at Waterhouse, only 20 miles from Bridport. And within three months of that discovery, 
there was a demand for better port facilities at Bridport because the people who wanted to access the gold needed to bring in heavy crushing machinery and that needed a decent jetty because you needed to get your heavy equipment off of your boats onto land. And in August 1869, tenders were let for a jetty at Bridport. One of the interesting things about this time is that Charles Manser, who was master of a cutter called the Pearl, opened the first restaurant in Bridport. And it was for the accommodation of visitors to the gold fields. And Charles Manser pointed out that before he'd opened his accommodation, visitors had to rely on the hospitality of the few residents of Bridport. So you can see in the top corner of this slide, it says Charles Manso wishes to inform the public he's opened a restaurant at Bridport for the convenience of visitors to the Waterhouse Goldfields. Soon after that, it was reported that Bald, Blythe and Hosey, which are names quite well known to people in Jetsonville, had discovered a valuable gold bearing reef of considerable extent. Only eight miles from Scottsdale and three miles from Bridport. This was the Bridport gold fields. And the newspaper at the time said, immense excitement prevails and nearly all the settlers are on the ground. The next picture we have is of the Bridport gold mine around 1890. Now we're not sure whether this is the Bridport gold mine or perhaps the Waterhouse gold mine, but it is a picture that shows you what it meant to be a gold miner. It was pretty rough life. On this slide, we can see some advertisements for shipping that was available. So on the left-hand side, regular traders to and from the gold fields, the water witch and the pearl. And on the right hand side, we can see some ads. So November 1876, Captain A.B. Smythe of Bridport has a schooner called the Wave and another one called the Coronella, servicing Bridport. Up above that, J. Taylor sails for Ringaruma and Bubiala. And it says all tin or down cargo stored free of charge at D. Campbell's store. Up above that, John Murphy advertises that ships sailing for Bridport, Ringaruma and George's Bay. And on the left hand side, again, ships sailing to Bridport. Boxing Day 1870. Boxing Day was a big day for locals when they really let their hair down, left their work alone and went and enjoyed themselves. And for most people from Scott's new country, that meant traveling to Boxing Day. So as this slide tells you from newspaper reports, the majority of the residents of Scottsdale, about 200 people, went to Bridport for what was known as Sports Upon the Sands. Newspapers of the time also said, should Waterhouse prove a payable gold field, Bridport will become the summer resort of many hundreds of Victorian families. In March 1872, we know from Alf Brewer's diary that everyone went to Bridport to watch a foot race. The race was 120 yards long between John McBean of Jetsonville and Albert Council and the prize was a very reasonable 10 pounds. Albert Council won by three yards easily, and it was held on Stevenson's old station. Now this photo is not of the actual race, but it's of the times, and it's interesting to see the fashions that the men wore. Plus you can notice that they've used string to mark out the lanes for the race. 